Now, today's text weaves together a number of scenes and a number of dramatis personae, some fictional, some anecdotal, kind of related to me, some substantive, real people out there in the world, it mixes them together in different ways. And each of these scenes and each of the characters informs my understanding of my practice's relationship to the objects of my research. Um, I describe my research practice as focusing on the act of disclosing presences at different sites. The particular circumstances within which I commonly work can be described as intervals, gaps, or pauses, whether they be between speech, between action, or between the occupation of a space. And what follows develops my strategies for disclosing presence and comes at a time when I'm becoming acutely aware of my own emerging visibility in my research. And this is the most explicit attempt to date to articulate my own position in relation to my research's preoccupations. And it's also a first attempt to explore a text itself as a site of presence awaiting disclosure. In the gaps between our words, I will trace your presence. An image surfaces, playing in the mind's eye like a movie. It has the uncanniness of a dream, but it really is a movie. The still image flickers into life. A domestic interior, post-war Japan, framed from a camera's low angle by a four by three window of grainy black and white. A wide shot, three adults standing in an apartment, a man and two women. They are poised to depart, suitcases in their hands, a bride-to-be on the verge of leaving her family home. They exit. But instead of following their story, their narrative, the movie camera unexpectedly chooses to return, lingering in the unoccupied rooms of the house, contemplating each, in turn, mirrors and the shapes of empty chairs. Breathe. Listen. Between our words, between our breaths, in the gaps, you and I are becoming. Germany, 1955. A young producer working at a Berlin radio station, runs his hand over the surface of a desk, salvaging small clippings of audio tape. Each fragment contains a pause, a breath, the shape of a thought, a hesitation, a withholding. Each contains a lacuna, edited out from some other speaker's utterances. He sweeps them into a small tin, pockets it, Later, he will edit these fragments together to create a tape recording composed not from words, but the gaps between them. 
Now he sits alone, reflecting that he has covertly become a collector of silences in a country and at a time where each silence, each spoken thought, is like an unexploded bomb, peopled not by absence, but by presences denied. Hold your breath. Count. Listen. It's only when I rest that I sense your presence. The son arrives at his father's house in the early afternoon, noticing that the garden is beginning to run to weeds. The house, as he <coughs> enters it, is quiet, but he senses his father is there inside. He will talk to his father today. He will tell the old man, at last, that instead of a recollected childhood of words exchanged, it is all the words withheld that he remembers. The frequent spells when he, the father, withdrew and would speak neither to the son nor to his wife. As a child, the son had lived amid the gaps his father had created, had inhabited the silences and the pauses produced by the father's withdrawal. He will ask now, why had his father behaved this way? The old man now will not, cannot answer and will only look at him questioningly. It is safe to ask now, because there will be no answer, only other silences. Living as he does, now, amid other ever-growing gaps, it's doubtful whether the father can remember those former interruptions in the discourse of the family's life. As the two men sit together, New gaps, new silences will pool around them, gathering like waves. As he watches the old man, both of them drifting back to their respective childhoods, the son reflects that the silences between them do not frame absence, but are freighted with all that is no longer utterable. Growing to adulthood without realising it, the son had become compelled by representations which somehow spoke to those earlier incomprehensible gaps in the performance of his family's life. Seeing them fleetingly reproduced in other unexpected places, he became fascinated by the possibility of once again inhabiting those gaps by other means, all the time compelled to discover what might be found therein. He himself became a collector of silences, his obsession leading him to recently vacated rooms where absences hung quietly like overcoats, expectant, ready to be claimed. Pause. Listen. Count. Breathe. Bodies in space. Bodies in space, breathing. My body in a space, breathing. The body activates the space. My body. This is not my body. What are these bodies to my body? We will have to fumigate again, the conservator says irritably. The beetles are still in there, alive and eating the skull outward from the marrow. The two of them stand looking up at the massive bulk of the blue whale's skull suspended from the ceiling by chains, a chapel of ribs and pectoral bones protruding from its base. 
receding over their heads. The conservator sighs. The museum cannot admit foreign bodies. So, once more, as before please, but we must be more careful with the gas. Last time there were birds falling from the sky. As the sun grew older, where at first he had perceived only absence, only silence, he now found that both had form. He slowly expanded his repertoire, discovering ever more novel gaps, identifying an infinite variety of intervals between. He gradually understood that this obsession with disclosing what lay within the gaps between words, between speech, between action, between the occupation of a room, in life, in literature, in art, was not his alone. He realised that the quality of silences was not the same, that the silences between lovers were not equivalent, superficially identical, but capable of signifying both deep contentment or separation and loss. He understood that conversation was created as much from the pauses between what was said as by the words themselves. And if a conversation, then why not a text? ISBN 09565692182018, circa 2010. The author has embarked on an act of calculated violence an act of destruction which he hopes will also prove revealing. Taking the leaves of a book he loves, taking the book apart, taking up a scalpel, he begins to cut into the skin of each successive page. Gaps in the text proliferate. The street of crocodiles becomes a tree of codes. He continues to cut, neatly excising words so that not even their ghosts remain, creating a multitude of carious gaps which cannot be spoken and cannot be named. Meanwhile, in a land that is not his own, a poet, deafened himself as a child, writes at night about a country that becomes deaf, because to hear is to be complicit deafness as an act of defiance, a silence of denial created not from absence but from what must not be heard. Breathe. Count. Listen. It's only when I rest that I sense your presence. New York, 1991. The composer sits by an open window in an apartment overlooking a busy thoroughfare. He talks to an interviewer as traffic rolls by below. A camera rolls too. Music, he says, is always the same. Noise, on the other hand, is always different. When we overlook the noise around us, we mistake it for silence, and we neglect to understand that no two silences are the same. What we think of as silence is always full of noise. Home. The template for all the silences, all the gaps that followed. He, the sun, has come home to a site that for all its familiarity 
nonetheless remains the hardest to perceive. He sits now with the old man, his father, without speaking, holding his hand. 